How many of you, if I were ask you to spend a dollar and you could get six dollars in return, would you take that deal? Okay, very smart audience. That's the same ratio if you were to invest one dollar in climate change resilient solutions, you could get at least six dollars out in health benefit. And that's a fantastic deal, and that deal is a reality right now because of climate resilient solutions. I'm Kari Nato. I'm a professor at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health, and I work at the Salada Institute at Harvard. And I'm going to explain today about climate resilience. Simply put, it is the act of managing the effects of climate change. And I'll talk to you about four types of climate resilience. And I work specifically as to how climate resilience solutions pertain to planetary health and human health. And so I'll talk about, first, preparedness. Second, I'll talk about infrastructure. Third, biodiversity. And fourth, social support. And these are all important because by implementing these types of climate resilient solutions, we will be able to make an impact, each of you, at the local, regional, national, and global level. So when we talk about climate resilience, it's often reactionary. It's sparked by the need to take immediate action. And that happened to me personally at my own doorstep. You're seeing here the wildfires in California. And for me, I had to evacuate my home three times, starting in 2018. And the first was a fire right next door. The fire chief knocked on the door. We were paralyzed. We were scared. We were very shocked. And we piled our family in the car, piled all our animals in the car, and left quickly. The second was one town away, and we were alerted by our smartphones. Again, that same paralysis and worry and anxiety-provoking actions, we were initially shocked again, and then we mobilized and evacuated. By the third evacuation, I realized that emergency preparedness plans were not being come available for communities at large. And most of those communities that didn't have these plans were those that didn't have smartphones, that had no way to evacuate, and also English was their second language. And so by the last evacuation, I decided to frame my research and focus on climate resilient solutions and actions. And it's moments like these and my family that I'm talking to you today. So it's not just wildfires that are extreme weather events. Other extreme weather events are associated with climate change. And the increase in extreme weather events has cost us about $1.5 trillion just in damages alone in the last decade. But there's a solution, and that's resilience. And resilience in and of itself is a concept that has an engineering core. You absorb the shock and you bounce back. And part of that bouncing back needs advanced preparedness. So that gets me to my first climate resilience solution, which is planning ahead. The National Institute of Business and Building Science has shown that by investing $1 into building materials, you can get $13 out in terms of preventing and saving against loss and damages. And that's shown here by the simple fact of changing building materials and ground materials, and you can prevent the ignition of a wildfire. Now, I talked about a local transmission system for alerts, and that was helpful when I had to evacuate my home. But that has to be built upon and available nationally as well as globally. So my colleagues at Harvard, Sachit Balsari and Caroline Bucky, have co-founded a company with Crisis Ready. And with this software program, they go to communities, ask the communities what they need for emergency preparedness, and then they give them satellite data and mobility data in order for them to be prepared for climate change. And with that, they're building resilience in those communities. And already in the last year, they've been able to help communities in the US with wildfire, as well as Libya with flooding, as well as Turkey and Syria with earthquakes. In addition, with the Climate Change Center at Harvard Chan School of Public Health called Sea change my colleagues there the medical doctors have created a climate toolkit 
to prepare community health workers for heat waves and how they can manage heat stress for their patients and reduce the likelihood of death. And that's important because now that's going around the globe in many different languages. FEMA also has published data recently on benefit cost analysis. And this is really exciting to know. Again, another good deal that for every dollar put in to managing emergencies and to have emergency preparedness plans, you can get at least $4 out from saving against and avoiding loss and damages. So this is a good deal that I all want us to be part of for the future. Now, how many of you have an electric vehicle or know someone who has an electric vehicle? Okay, good news. So we all want to have better infrastructure for charging stations. And with that, the Salada Institute this past August announced a program between MIT and Harvard in which they're trying to create a seamless electric vehicle charging station system across the US. So good news. That type of collaboration, though, needs to expand, and we need to have more infrastructure. And that gets me to my second climate resilience solution, which is infrastructure. And that's needed to be able to replace fossil fuels by renewable energy. And as a physician, I know that fossil fuels can kill. They create unhealthy pollution, and they kill about 7 million people per year. So this infrastructure is very important for climate resilience. In that, when we think about what is needed for infrastructure, MIT had a beautiful report in which, because of good satellite data and data analytics, they were able to get to the three kilometer by three kilometer resolution. And that allowed them to be able to see to what degree extreme weather events might affect our infrastructure and therefore prepare to be able to mitigate any circumstance for the electric grid against extreme weather conditions. This is an example of wind speed that is able to be charted so that, again, those preventative measures are possible with resilience. The third resilience that I'd like to talk to you about today is biodiversity. This is so important to be able to think about how biodiversity can protect our planet against unpredictable weather, against heat stress, and against food insecurity. Biodiversity is so important because it represents a solution both on mitigation and adaptation, and it makes economic sense. For example, if you increase the tree canopy in a city by 30%, you decrease the likelihood of heat-related illnesses by 30%. That also saves money. For every dollar you put into planting a tree, you get at least $5 out from preventing someone from going to the emergency room. And that's another good deal for our planet. But trees are also important for sequestering carbon. Oceans also sequester carbon. And algae is part of that system, sequestering carbon and emitting oxygen. We thank the oceans for every other breath that we breathe. Importantly, biodiversity is going to decrease global warming, and we need to take care of it as a mechanism of resilience. When we think about biodiversity, it helps human health, planetary health, and also mental health. Our minds are with the troubled understanding of living in a world with climate change, and that can be paralyzing. That can be anxiety-provoking. And that's what happened to us when we evacuated our home. But in changing that mindset from a mindset of doom to a mindset of hope and promise, we also know that as humans, we have the capacity to understand ambiguity, to be able to embrace information, to take that knowledge, to be curious, and to talk to others. We also have the capacity to empathize. We have the capacity to join in collective action. And because of that, to be able to switch a mindset from doom to hope and promise, we need to know about solutions. And we need to talk and discuss and have open discourse and transparency about those solutions. And that's going to help us provide physical and emotional support to families and especially communities that are inequitably exposed to environmental justice issues. In addition, that will help children and grandchildren and multiple generations to come. So, in summary, we are at a major turning point to redesign sustainable societies. 
we can turn and make the shift towards climate resilience and a mindset of hope and action. And we must. Looking back now at California, we've made a lot of progress since 2018 when I had to do my first evacuation. With that, we've already put in alert systems, and that has helped a lot of communities in environmental justice areas. In addition, we've talked to indigenous peoples and learned how to better manage our vegetation and forests because of the traditional ecology that they have taught us. We also have better funding in California. And because of that, we've made progress. That's great for environmental health, as well as human health and planetary health and economic health, but we have a lot more to do. And today, I've talked to you about rising to resilience and about solutions that can save us. However, in that, we need to make sure that we act. And I have an urgent message now in closing. All of you have the ability to talk and advocate and to change policy. You can either join conservation groups, you can fight for renewable energy, you can research solutions as to how well they work in climate change. You can also talk about solutions to your neighbor. These are all roles that we can play, and there's no time to waste. Importantly, climate resilient solutions are vital to human health and planetary health. Act now, it's worth it. Thank you.